It's no secret that the animated movies I've featured on this show have so far been of the more... adult variety. Yeah. Anyway, to prove that cartoon characters don't need to murder or have sex with each other in order to be on this show, this episode I'm going to review an honest-to-god children's animated movie. That ought to cut down on the weirdness factor, right? R right? Epic Days of the Dinosaur, or just Epic as it's sometimes known, is an Australian animated movie from 1983, or 1985? I don't know, the info's a little fuzzy there. Made by Yoram Gross, who's probably best known for movies like Dot and the Kangaroo, Dot and the Bunny, Dot and the Koala, you get the idea. But this movie actually has some special significance for me because it's actually one of the first movies I can ever remember picking out myself from the video store. Let me see if I can put you in my mindset back then. Oh man, dinosaurs! Awesome! I love dinosaurs! That thing looks like a dinosaur. Kinda. Maybe. I don't really know what all this other stuff is. Uh, is that the Wicker Man in the background? But whatever! Dinosaurs! Rent it for me, Mommy! I hadn't seen the movie since I first rented it all those years ago, and I really only had vague, fragmented memories of it. It was only ever released on VHS in North America, and information on it is extremely rare. So for a while there, I actually wondered if it was even a real movie or just something I hallucinated when I was high on Cocoa Puffs when I was a kid. Well, I finally managed to get my hands on a copy, so let's take a walk down memory lane with Epic Days of the Dinosaur. Well, I gotta admit the title is pretty epic, in an episode of Land of the Lost kind of way. And once again, for a movie from the 80s, the animation is really good. Oh, wait a second, this is live action again. Why must these animated movies deceive me like this? Do you hear it? It's a dingo. Dingoes have lived on this continent for thousands of years, and they're one of mankind's best friends. And they're one of mankind's best friends. I gotta say, this is the weirdest Australian travel promo I've ever seen. I should probably be quiet, though. The narrator's about to tell us how the Earth was created. In the beginning, there was darkness. The Earth was formed. Back then, it was a delicious scoop of ice cream floating in space. Then the sun rose, spreading its fierce heat across the Earth's surface. Except for one part of the Earth known as Canada. By the way, that's director John Huston as the narrator. And for all you youngins out there who aren't familiar with him, just imagine if Stanley Kubrick had narrated The Land Before Time, and you'll start to have some idea of just how weird this is. Wait a second, director of animation? Well, the guy must have had an easy job because we're five minutes in and so far I haven't seen any. Oh, wait, there we go. So in case you couldn't tell, the only animation in the movie is the characters, who are then put over live-action backgrounds, which is a technique Yorm Gross used in a lot of his movies. Mixing live-action and animation? Who the hell does that? Anyway, the movie begins with a flood and a family of dingoes trying to escape from... Gossamer from Looney Tunes? Quick, just point out the audience and it'll go away. And Epic has two things all good kids' movies should start out with. Death and kidnapping. I'm serious, the dingo's puppies drown, so the parents just adopt a couple of human babies that are drowning instead. And once again, I'll try and resist the urge to make a dingo stole your baby joke. The king and queen of the dingoes adopted the human babies. Thus the dingoes and people became friends. What, by kidnapping their children? Why don't you see if their parents are okay with this? Here's another thing this kid's movie has, underage nudity. I'm not joking, there is actual baby wang I had to cover up for this video. Even Once Upon a Girl wasn't that messed up. Okay, so it was, but you get what I'm saying here. The human kids are Saul and Luna, who were raised by the dingoes. Here's hoping this doesn't mean the only voice acting in the movie is barking sounds. They learned to talk when the sounds they made formed words. Okay... I guess that's one way to learn English. You know, I feel bad for Saul and Luna. Not only will they never truly fit in with their family, they'll also never truly fit in with the background either. 
Also, apparently Australia has the moon's gravity. What are you doing? Look, they're footprints. They're different from ours. So you learn to speak English out of nowhere, but you're just figuring this out now? Well, enough questions. Time for more frolicking. Come on in, Saul. You never learn to swim like a dingo if you don't go in the water. Yeah, what possible harm could come from going in the water at... Oh, uh, <laughs> right. Forgot about that. Saul sees Gossamer, uh, I mean, the spirit of evil, in the water, and proceeds to tell his parents through interpretive dance. Like, there, in the water! I saw it! I swam in this river for years. I've never seen a monster. Yes, yeah, son, there's no such thing as monsters. Unless you count that one at the beginning that killed my real children. But what are the odds of that happening again? Uh-oh, I think the director forgot about the movie and just filmed his peyote trip in the desert. Or maybe he just wishes it was another movie. Yeah, you're right, movie. I should be watching Fantasia right now. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking that for a movie subtitled Days of the Dinosaur, there haven't been a whole lot of dinosaurs so far. Well, get ready, people, because this is the closest thing this movie has to an actual dinosaur. Well, I guess that makes sense. I mean, after all, the title just says Dinosaur Singular, not Plural. That's more truthful than calling a movie The Last Dinosaur, even though there's clearly more than one dinosaur in it. Oh. Oh, my God. Yeah, you better run, kids. It's a known fact that a T-Rex can shuffle it up to 30 miles per hour. Not only that, but they also have razor-sharp lips. So, everybody, you want to know how Saul defeats this thing? Saul fights courageously, injuring the dinosaur, winning the battle. That's right, everybody. If you can't afford to animate an exciting fight scene, just have John Huston say that there is an exciting fight scene. And after Saul defeated the T-Rex, ten more appeared, and there was an epic fight scene that was way better than the one in Peter Jackson's King Kong. Then Scarlett Johansson and Katy Perry showed up, and they totally started making out. But you'll just have to take my word for it. So what else exciting is going on? One day Saul saw something strange on the ground. It was a footprint. Hey, he said it was a footprint, dumbass. Didn't you hear him? The footprint actually belongs to another human that Saul and Luna haven't seen before. And just to show you where this movie's priorities are, it glosses over the T-Rex fight, yet we get to see every second of this. What's inside? No one will be seated during the thrilling looking at a didgeridoo scene. I guess Saul and Luna's dingo parents taught them well because when the girl's family comes looking for her, they just straight up try and take her away from them. No, no. He won't let go! Wait, we're just kidnapping you to show that we're friends! Well, congratulations, you two. You almost rescued that girl from her loving family. And then Saul and Luna discovered fire. But that's a tale for a better movie. Saul and Luna discovered fire. And they danced a fire dance to celebrate. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dance sequence? Oh, no. No, I'm fixing this. Good God, this is like the ending to 2001 if it overdosed on Flintstones chewables. The smoke from the fire made Sol and Luna drowsy. Are you sure it was the smoke from the fire? Because I have a feeling the animators were smoking something else when they made this. Sol dreamed, and he heard the voice of the king of the dingoes. Yeah, you know what? I think it's about time for me to hear the king of the dingoes. Excuse me. Well, we're halfway through, so I guess it's about time we add a proper plot to this thing. The King of the Dingoes tells Saul and Luna that they can either go back to the human world or stay with the Dingoes. If they want to stay with the Dingoes, they have to find the secrets of life consisting of earth, wind, fire, and water. Heart. Nope, there's no heart, because that shit is lame even for this cartoon. If you succeed, you will rule as the king and queen of the dingoes. King and queen? But aren't Sol and Luna brother and sister? Ew. Sol and Luna should have the elements of life in no time. After all, look at how much ground they can cover just by walking in place. Oh, and here's an example of some of the perils they encounter on their journey. Oh, 
Uh-oh, she's gonna fall. She's totally gonna fall here, people. I hope she doesn't fall and- Okay, never mind, she's fine. They run into the spirit of evil again, although I don't know why they're bothering with the fire. Just give them some spider goulash and I'll leave you alone. Oh, and apparently the representation of evil in this movie isn't afraid of fire. Go figure. <laughs> Oh, stub toes! Evil's one weakness! Oh, and having a water monster throw up on it. I, I guess that works, too. Though the water destroyed the fire, Evil was too clever to be killed. It rose as steam. So what is he, the spirit of steam now? Watch out, kids, or he'll ruin your wooden furniture. So Saul manages to get water and fire, even though I'm pretty sure those would cancel each other out. Meanwhile, Luna goes to a cave to get wind and... Wait a second, is that Trumpy from Pod People? Do you know what playing is, Trumpy? Yes, it's where I break you in half. Ah, I'm sure they're friendly. The little cave creatures, Pug and Wug, only wanted to make friends. So they kidnapped her. And protect her from the blue monster who guarded the spirit of the wind. That wasn't a clip of Luna getting attacked by the blue monster. That was the entire scene of Luna getting attacked by the blue monster. Okay, I'm lying a little bit here. They do repeat the same shot twice. And I guess the blue monster must not be a big deal since Luna seems to instantly forget about it. It's mine. Come on. Uh, a monster just tried to pull your face off a second ago. You should probably be concerned about that. No? You're not gonna worry about it? No? Eh, okay. Eventually, Luna learns from the cave Trumpies that she has to get past the blue monster in order to get to the Spirit of the Wind. And do you know how they get by the blue monster? They just walk past it. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't wake up and chase them, they don't have to figure out some trick to get by it, they just walk past it. It's incredible. This movie is only an hour long, but it feels twice that. It lingers on things like staring at a didgeridoo and then just glosses over potentially exciting parts. Not to mention weird monsters and characters will just randomly appear out of nowhere and then are quickly forgotten about. It's almost like the filmmakers said, hmm, how much crazy random shit can we fit into one movie but still have it feel as if nothing's happening? Anyway, they find the spirit of wind slash birdo, but they're soon interrupted by the spirit of evil or fire, clouds, eh, whatever, I'm just gonna go back to calling him Gossamer. Luna used the spirit of the wind to fight the evil cloud and blow it away. That is a good strategy. After all, its mouth does look like it was made for blowing things. Alright, I deserve that one. You know what, I'm convinced this movie originally started out as a short for heavy metal, but then the animators realized they forgot to drop boobs and said, eh, just pad it out and make it a kid's movie, it'll be fine. I'm Saul Trapped Wind. Which meant he now had to invent Beano. Oh, hey, look, I guess this movie does have another dinosaur. Oh, wait, what am I saying? Pterodactyls aren't technically dinosaurs. Never mind. Well, this is as far as I can take you, kids. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go rescue Tarna from the Loch Nahr. Later. Saul and Luna turned to watch the flying creature vanish into the sky. And by that, I mean they watched it stay still while the background moved. I sure hope they wrap up this journey quick. All this walking is seriously starting to affect Saul and Luna's posture. Okay, so they got fire, water, and wind. Now all they need is earth, which they get from... The Rock Biter? They look like poorly animated hands, don't they? These are the secrets. I will put them back into the earth, together with your love. Love? Ah, oh, crap, I was wrong. This movie does have heart in it. Well, you found the secrets of life. Now here's your reward. You get to watch your adopted parents die right in front of you, then create a new line of dingoes through an incestuous relationship. Happy ending, kids! So that's Epic Days of the Dinosaur. And seeing it again, I think I understand now why my memories of it were so... fragmented. The movie has some interesting ideas and concepts, but they're presented really haphazardly, even for a kid's movie. And although it's short at only an hour long, I think most kids today would probably find this movie pretty slow going. You know what, though? I'm glad I saw it again. If only to confirm that it's actually real and not just some fever dream I had when I was a kid. Because whether it's Mother Goose porn, Russian hobbits, or homicidal Spider-Man, one of the reasons I do this show is to prove to the world that these things are real. Well, that's all for now. Until next time.
Oh, why hello there. Couldn't see you with these fucking glasses on. Anyway, you're probably here because my 50th episode's coming up next and you're wondering what I'm gonna do for it. Hmm, let's see... Heavy Metal? No. The Room? That's eh, been done. Flash Gordon? Eh, it's really more of a hundredth episode movie. Hmm. You know what? I think it's about time for some more Godzilla. <laughs>